but thank you for coming to our first of our series of speaker events for this year. Sorry, I'm just going to make sure that that uh, gets set for you guys here. Okay, there we go. Um, so first thing, we've got a great season lineup coming this year. Uh, we're changing it up. Historically, we've had this as more of a dairy speaker series, and it's always been one location in the afternoon. And this year, we're varying it up quite a bit with different topics and locations and timing. So tonight's kind of, I think we had a few people go to the Grange at noon today looking for our speaker series. So um, it's great that you guys found us here. And we've got all sorts of topics this year. Um, next month, animal health and herd management, water quality and outreach. We have our annual manure nutrient management training, holistic horse management, land management for berries, pasture management, our small farm expo in March, and then how social is your farm, so how to do kind of social media outreach for your farm and your farming practices if that's something you're interested in. So we have a great lineup. Um, I do want to thank our sponsors this year, the Whatcom Conservation District, who, uh, who our staff kind of puts us on every year. Uh, Whatcom Farmers for Clean Water and the WID, so the Water Improvement Districts. And this one in particular is sponsored by the Bertrand WID. Uh, so get to know your WID. I apologize for the graphic didn't come out great, but uh, there are uh, six WIDs, almost seven, uh, but there's six WIDs. And the Bertrand WID here, mostly in the Bertrand Watershed, is tonight. And Pete Bloss, who's with us. Tonight, if you don't mind standing up, you're our Bertrand WID representative, and maybe you can talk a little bit about what the WIDs are and what uh, you guys do. Well, some of the things we've done is uh, we put in some culverts and some fish-friendly floodgates, and we're currently working with uh, about three farmers that uh, irrigate out of the Bertrand, and we want to get them on wells so we can leave the water in the Bertrand. And then we're working on some seasonal uh, water rights so that we can pump water in August and September into the Bertrand to add water. So those, are, those are some of the things we're working on right now. Fantastic. And how would folks get involved with their WID if they um, so desire? And how are they connected? <laughs> That's how you're connected. <laughs> Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and so, uh, you, a little bit more in information, you can go to the Bertrand WID. Each WID has their own website. And there's also a story map. This is a very hard URL to remember. I understand that, but if you go to the WIDs, uh, you can find this link. And this is a really neat um, story map. It's essentially like a web page that runs you through a story about what are the WIDs and what do each of them look like in their land base. It's a really neat. Um, project that was put together. So tonight's talk, we're talking about winterize your farm. And I'm just going to do a handful of background uh, management practices. Uh, Creed Achiever is also going to give a few. And then we're going to have two farmers speak that, thank you Rob for showing up. <laughs> Rob Perry, our dairy farmer, Ron Hoodford is a feed farmer here. So these two guys um, are going to be talking about their experiences and what they're using. Um, on their farms as well. So to get started, number one, you know, we want to think about this time of year, and it's been raining a lot, so you've probably been thinking about it a lot, is are we ready for this rain, for the wind, for the cold? Is your farm ready? Is your pasture ready? Are your fields ready? Is everything ready? So we want to talk about some different aspects of that. And one of the things that we consider is when we think about are you ready, well we have to say are we ready for what and why? What's, is this a big deal? So when do we have an issue? When are we not ready? And some of the things to consider that would lead to a type of a pollution event, which is really what we want to avoid, not only do you want to make sure that your soils are going to be happy and all and your animals are healthy, but that we're not going to have a pollution event over the winter. So number one is a pollutant availability. Is there anything out there to run off? Is, do we already have muddy pastures? Or did your uh, forage quality degrade in a field that's right next to a ditch? Do we have nutrients that are going out a little bit late? Um, do we have grazing that isn't set back from a ditch or an area yet? So there's manure out there. So 
Number one, do we have pollutants available? And number two, do we do something wrong with those pollutants, right? So it's, they can be out there, but we also need another contributing factor that somehow we had improper application or grazing or of the of nutrients applied, manure applied, grazing done. So that could be on our timing. Did we say, oh boy, it's gonna rain, I should get out there, please don't ever do that. Reverse your thinking, oh boy, it's gonna rain, I'm gonna wait <laughs> until our weather improves again. Uh, maybe the method that you use, uh, you're, you're putting solids out when you should be doing a light application of liquids, which is gonna get into the soil faster, or we're looking at, you know, doing a surface application, we could have kind of harrowed or tilled that in in some way. So there's some type of a method, your rates, of course, you want to make sure that we're not getting really heavy rates out there where we're going to have a lot of availability of that pollutant piece and making sure that it's in the right place. Next, you need some kind of a catalyst, right? A weather event. Obviously, this time of year, it's rain. It could be wind also that's blowing things off your field. Uh, we have high water tables. So that's not quite yet, but as the season comes up, if you live in an area where that water table comes up to the surface, any type of rain that also hits that, it's gonna run off. There's nowhere for that water to get in your soil. So whatever's left, has it has to go somewhere, right? So we've got a few of those. Flooding as well, if you're in an area that's prone to flooding. If you've got something there, it has the potential to go away with those flood waters. And lastly, poor field conditions. Our field conditions coming right out of the summer are usually great. You know, they're able to take in quite a bit of water. Things still look pretty good. We've had a little bit of rain to really recharge our forage on those areas. But we're going to start coming into where those soils can start getting saturated. Or if you have a big slope, that's just going to increase the potential for whatever is on that slope to be able to get to a water course. So a flat field, you may only have to be 40 feet back. A slope field, you may have to be 100 feet back, let's say, for the same kind of transport rate. So we do have to think about all those things. What is your surface cover? Do we have grass? Is it denuded? How does that look? So that opens it up for movement. When we have a nice thick stand of grass, things don't typically move off of there versus when it's um, really open. And um, lastly, as I kind of mentioned, the saturated soil is bit. So that's kind of when we could potentially have an issue. So let's talk about some ways that we can um, install some practices that are really going to help us assist with not having those issues and really help our farm, help our fields and our soils. So the first one, a big one, is plant relay or cover crop. So if you're growing an annual crop like corn, planting a cover crop or relay crop is really going to assist with keeping some type of vegetation on that field over the winter so you're not having sediment losses. Sediment losses are trifled. And number one, you can have runoff and those sediments can carry pathogens and nutrients, which is not great. Number two, it's sediment into a ditch or waterway and if that starts building up, now we have drainage issues. And number three, you're losing all that really hard earned soil. So all the work that you're putting in there, whether that's really great nutrients via manure that's building up your soil health until you're grazing, it doesn't matter. You're building that soil and any kind of a runoff of your sediment, that's a lot of hard work you've just lost. So we want to keep all that soil there. So this um, cover crop holds all that soil. It keeps it from running away, as well as takes up any kind of excess nutrients. So at the end of the year, if for some reason our nitrogen budgeting just didn't go right because drought conditions prevented it or our grass didn't grow as great at the end of the season or we just didn't quite get our budgeting right, we have excess at the end of the year, a cover crop is going to take all that up so we don't lose it down to groundwater. So two things there. Um, you also can, which is great, is harvest this for feed, which is a wonderful another feed source that you have. Spring versus uh, fall planting, there is a big difference here. And even if you've got a pasture that you're renovating, this kind of falls into that. Or if you've got an area that you need to reseed, uh, it was an animal pathway, whatever that may be, this still kind of has that cover crop piece of it. We don't want to lose that area. So typically, in a corn crop, we like a spring planting. This is technically a relay crop. So that you plant it kind of early season when corn is a little bit shorter. And by the time the corn is harvested, that forage, that grass um, cover crop has already started establishing itself, building a root system. So it's really gonna take off. And you can see the fields around here. 
that are nice and green and going already that can establish before we get a lot of winter frost and chill and those nor'easters that can come down and just decimate that really quickly. So it's nice um, to get that in early. Do you have a question? Does the relay, relay crop uh, affect the tonnage uh, because it's uh, using up more, utilizing more of the water during the summer as opposed to a couple crop in the fall? That's a really good question. And it will use a little, but not a lot. You, when you take it off, you'll notice it's not like this a sod cover. It's not using a lot of that water. And most of our soils have such good water holding capacity there um, that you're not going to see a big difference. I don't know if, um, Chris, if you have any input on that either, if you've looked at anything, but the studies I've seen through um, Canada, who's done a lot of that work, it's they haven't seen a big challenge there. But I noticed on one field they uh, planted a winter a week and the ducks and the geese and the swans mowed it down to nothing as opposed to uh, winter rye. Is there a difference? In the, the variety of the grass? Yeah, do the yeah. ducks like that a winter wheat better than uh, rye? So that's a really good one too. So if you're going to harvest your cover crop versus just plant it and kind of uh, spray it out and till it in, you're probably going to plant different things. Something like Italian ryegrass is going to take a lot quicker. Something like triticale is going to be better to harvest, let's say. The ducks, I don't know if they have a preference for flavors. I think it tends to be maybe where it's planted and how well it's going for what they... I, I have a feeling that it's probably like wine varieties. They're all good. Some are just better than others, is what I'm guessing with ducks and cover crops. But, um, that's a great question too. So the other, um, as he was alluding to, is cover crop. So that's after your crop comes off, you interseed or, or you, you seed out there and it takes. And so the difference here, Rod, and those are really good questions to consider and it might be on a field by field and just a trial basis if you're kind of excited about experimenting that. Try it one way one year and one the other and see if you notice a difference in production. But the fall cover, the biggest problem here is that if it get like if this year corn came off early and it was a great year that the cover crop, we had plenty of time for it to take, it was warm, it was moist, it did pretty great. But in those years where corn doesn't come off till late October, we don't have a lot of time for it to get seeding and then early November we get really cold, it's, this one is just gonna suffer um, a bit more there. So those are kind of our difference in those two. And I think farm by farm, field by field, of course, is going to be very specific on the mixture of cover crop that you like if you're harvesting it for feed or if you're just growing it. Different soil types are going to take cover crops a lot better than others, so the variety will differ there. There's a really good publication out of um, Agri-Food Agri and Agriculture Canada on, on cover crops and some of this information. In, and Shabtai Bittman up there has done a great job on that. Any more questions, Ron? Okay. <laughs> so the next one um, are buffers. And this is plus or minus on folks. Um, a lot of people see this and cringe. Some are okay with it. Some folks have this on their property. Some are doing creative methods. And the point being that having some type of a filter, if you will, between your field and a ditch can be positive. If you already have a grass filter, that grass is acting like a vegetated area. If you don't, um, let's say you grow raspberries or blueberries, you have a perennial crop that always has a dirt surface exposed, or you do grow a corn crop, but you don't necessarily like growing a cover crop, or you know that every year the geese are coming and they're compacting it, eating it, and it'll just never take no matter what you do, which happens in quite a few areas, something like this is going to be probably beneficial. And they come in all different sizes and types and you find what custom works for your field. One thing that's been pretty popular are planting hedgerows and this has a dual benefit, um, actually a tri-benefit in many ways. Number one, this is kind of a comparison, there's a stream right here, you have one side that's been vegetated, this side was planted. These don't have to be very wide, 10, 15 feet. And it can now act as kind of a shade barrier in your stream, which decreases the need for clean out of grass, et cetera. So it really does help with kind of decreasing or eliminating your ditch maintenance. It'll provide shade for that stream if you do have a fish bearing or other habitat rich stream that you're trying to encourage. 
And it will also act as a filter, so it's going to collect a lot of sediment or other things that are trying to run off your field and collect it in that area. And then lastly, if you have um, berries or other crops that you're spraying, this acts as a spray buffer for that ditch, so it'll be captured in the foliage there rather than just drifting right into the ditch. So there are some benefits to this type of um, a buffer system. It's not very big and you don't really have to touch it. You can trim it up so that you can still effectively be in your field once a year and that's about it. So everyone, some people just like doing a permanent grass strip, uh, like a field strip or a filter board, <laughs> filter strip or a field border. Um, and you can kind of do that in many ways. Weeds and blackberries do not count as filter strips. So <laughs> I'm just gonna put that out there. Uh, so you really do want something active and this is you know, you have the benefit here too of habitat. So you've got pollinator habitat encouragement that can be really good depending on what you're growing out there. And it keeps animals or your cattle or whatnot out of the ditch as well if you have a grazing system. So there's a lot of interesting ways to adapt these things for your farm. Uh, the next one for grazing practices. So a lot of these things, um, Green is gonna go in a little more, more detail about parts of these, but Having a good grazing rotation system, in other words, make sure that your animals aren't on an area just absolutely denuding it or making cutting green, as I like to call it, where there is no vegetation. Just make sure you've always got something growing in your soil's gonna be better infiltration of soil um, or water in there, your animals are gonna have healthier grass, everything's gonna be a lot more beneficial. And or fencing in critical areas. So I'm gonna talk about setbacks here in a second, but just make sure that you've got a port, you can do a permanent fencing system if that's what you like, or a portable one, that you can just move your animals so you don't have to have them 40 feet all year round or 100 feet all year round. It can be 10 in the dry season, so you can make sure that you're getting that grass grazed and kind of cut, if you will, almost like a mowing system, and then you move it back when we need to be a little bit more protective. So you can really have some moving and flexibility there. And then, of course, you want to make sure you've got mud mitigation. You don't want your animals standing in mud all the time. That's just for their health and well-being. And, of course, runoff prevention is a big one here where we can make sure all these things are aligned and working really well. We're not losing all of our soil and our pasture and everything else. Ditches and streets. So what I was kind of alluding to here, seasonal setback. So this is guidance for manure application. It's for solids. It's for liquid. And, frankly, it kind of works for grazing, too that during our dry summer months, June, July, August, up to 10 feet. This is great. We want you to be able to fertilize your fields and make sure that you've got a good, healthy grass stand or whatever else you're farming out there and make sure that's great. In the shoulder season, September, uh, April, March, April, May, when we still have rain and our fields are a little saturated, September is plus or minus every other year it seems to rain and then it doesn't. But nonetheless, we're gonna start moving that back a little bit. We wanna have a little bit more insurance when it does start raining. And come October right now, all the way through our winter season through February, 80 feet is what uh, the literature and some of our studies have shown is the most protective for staying back from that water course. And again, it's gonna be specific to your fields. It's kind of general guidance. And it also somewhat depends on your manure application equipment. Big guns can never be closer than 40 feet from a ditch because of drift, and there's a few other caveats like that that are in this tiny text down here. But um, the point being that it's nice to have this variable farmable area on your, whether it's you're applying manure, fertilizers, or grazing. Um, we want you to be able to have that flexibility to be protective as well as to be effectively utilizing your farm. And last bit here that I'm gonna talk about that some of you may or may not know about we created a real-time manure spreading advisory uh, the last couple years we've been testing up. And this is a place, I took this just today, this morning, that you can go, and this is Whatcom County here, and see what is the risk of applying manure today, tomorrow, and the next day. So it gives you, when you, you know, click on your area, it's going to give you the three-day risk rating forecast. So you know, like, oh, wow, this is not a good time to go out. Or you may see red, red, green. In other words, you can start planning ahead for when you want to get your manure out there and vice versa. It may be green and then it's red soon. You might as well get out while the risk is low so that you're not applying in a high risk time. And then this is kind of a general guidance. You can take it a step further and click here on this field risk assessment and you'll get this worksheet that you can go through that asks you questions about what your soil moisture and water table depth and a few other things. 
so that you can at the end um, get a risk rating for applying to that field on that day. So it's a nice way for you to be able to go through a process for a decision-making tool that you can ensure that when you do go out on your field that it's going to be right. In the summertime you can just look at the advisory for the most part to make sure that you're capturing those weird storms that come through. Even when it's 80 degrees and beautiful, we could be expecting inch of rain in a few days and it's hard to know that unless you're checking up on that. And the same this time of year, it can go the other way. So this is one tool that we've created um, so that folks can have a place to go and look at that. Um, and you can find it on the Whatcom CD webpage or on wadairyplan.org. And while the, we do have dairy, of course, in the name there, it's actually been kind of renovated to apply to all livestock. So you can go there and get all these tools and information as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Karina now to talk about um, further about some of your own farm uh, management things for the winter. So my name is Karina Cheever. I'm a farm planner at Walker Conservation District also, along with Chuck Timlin who's in the back and Katie Penke who uh, welcomed you in at the door. So building on what Nicole talked about, uh, I'm going to be pretty brief just talking about the farmstead itself uh, and then we're going to have Dockenford and Rod Perry come up and talk about how they've applied these practices on their farms. So um, one thing, I mostly work with small farmers, so this is going to be a bit towards that aspect. Um, but one thing we talk about a lot is pasture management and also using a heavy use area. Um, so what you can see on this graphic, which you can find on our website, uh, is that the heavy use area is located uh, in the middle. We want to think about if we're going to have our animals there during the winter, it, how close are we to um, runoff concerns and um, we want to address those uh, runoff from surface water that's entering uh, that heavy use area, whether it's from gutters or driveways. Uh, so in those uh, heavy use areas, you're probably going to have shelter for your animals, which uh, can be the side of a building that they can get behind, or if you're going to build a shed that's in that area. And of course with, um, and then in that in that uh, heavy use area, you're going to have water supply for your animals. Um, and so, you know, during the winter, there's a lot of wind or freezing in certain areas of the county. And so, uh, if your water tank is continuous flow, you want to make sure you're addressing if there's any overflow and where that overflow is going to go to. If it's a gutter, if you can figure out some sort of diversion back into your um, back into your gutter outlet or if it's continuous flow, having some place for it to feed to if the animals aren't um, drinking it as fast as you're supplying it. Rod's going to talk about a heater uh, that he puts in. Yeah. What do you mean by continuous flow? Um, well, if you are, if you're like, if you have um, a gutter that's providing water to it, it's, well, it's not continuous, but during the rain event, you're going to have water and you can't just turn it off, so making sure that you're addressing if there's a way for, uh, for that water to go while it's raining and it's overflowing. Um, that's something that's maybe dairies, it's not as common on dairies, but small farms are collecting that rainwater um, and using tanks or rain barrels. Um, and then in the heavy use area, your animals are probably going to be in a smaller area, so if there's mud, you, um, you don't want your animals standing in mud. And so one thing we can help you um, design is a heavy use area removing the organic materials off and bringing in extra materials, whether it's some people prefer gravel or they prefer sand or even hog fuel. Uh, and this is Don Hufford's farm on the right from a few years ago, and he has hog fuel. And then this is a landowner that we worked with uh, on the left that actually put in pea gravel for their horses. So the material that you're bringing in is really site specific and what you want for your, your animals. But having a material in there that has that's deep enough um, that water filters through it, uh, and uh, that way your animals aren't standing in mud. And then it also helps you if you're doing chores in that area not to be in the mud. Uh, and so part of maintaining your heavy use area is if there's gutters and downspouts, you want to, now that we're, I mean, everyone had the rainfall the last few nights, so if you know if your gutters are broken already, um, you should go out there and check them and see if you can fix them. Uh, and you want to, you really want to limit that clean water. Anything that's coming from a gutter or your roof is considered clean. If it's coming from your driveway where your animals aren't, that's clean water and you don't want that adding to your heavy use area. You don't want to add to that mud, um, a mud problem that you could have. 
So um, it's really important that we have those gutters downspout and downspouts. Uh, so from this you can see a um, hundred by hundred square foot roof. Uh, that's almost 200,000 gallons of water just in the winter. And this is using 30 inches of rain. There's some areas in this county are that, that are getting significantly more than that. Or a 12 by 12 roof if you're on a small farm, that's probably something closer to what you're, uh, you have. And that's almost 3,000 gallons. That's 90, uh, 90 gallons for every inch of rainfall that we're receiving. So it's really important to keep that roof water out of where you have your animals um, because going to add to that mud and then additionally it could add to the transport of that nutrients off of your heavy use area if you aren't located far enough away from um, surface water concerns. So another part of course is the manure management. You're collecting all this manure during the winter but it's not appropriate to be applying to the fields. You have to store it somewhere. Um, so there's different options if you have a space and you want to keep it in the field. Um, you know, making sure that tarp is over it and um, tied down and protected from the wind. Or if you have a, a slab and ecology blocks, again, keeping a tarp over it. Um, you don't want to lose your hard-earned nutrients. All that feed you're putting into your animal, all that manure is fertilizer that you can use on your fields when it comes time to apply it. So it's tarping the manure pile is a huge benefit to you. It's saving those nutrients for your pile. It's, um, it's built, it, the tarp keeps the heat in and your compost process goes faster and the, the higher heat really creates that environment that the, that the microorganisms like and um, really are happy and compost that manure faster. So if you have the rain going to it, it's too soggy, it's, the nutrients are going to wash out and the heat is not going to be able to build up. Um, and so at the conservation district, we can actually provide these tarps. There's a tarp in that. This is one that we provided in the photo. They're um, 16 by 20 feet, so they're significant. And this is something, a practice that we would really like everybody to adopt. And so if you're interested in the tarp, you can come by our office and pick one up. Um, yeah. And then, so part of um, getting ready for winter is taking our, like Nicole said, taking our animals off of the pasture. Because um, what you see on the surface is that grass growth, and grass grows dormant in the, in the winter months. If you're still grazing your animals out there, they're eating all the grass that's not going to regrow. And then also, when, as they're eating that grass, the root growth is getting smaller, so you're damaging the root structure. And come spring, when the grass is going to try and regrow, it's not going to have that rooting depth that it needs to uptake water and grow faster. The grass blades are also kind of like solar panels. If you don't have enough blade out of uh, available, then the grass is going to grow slower. Um, and so another concern is not just the grass growth, but with compaction. If your animals are out there during the winter and the soils are really wet, you're compacting that soil. And compaction uh, leads to, uh, in the winter, if it's the soil's compacted, you'll have even more ponding. And then come summer, when the grass is trying to grow with that compacted soil, there's not enough soil pores and there's not enough water holding capacity. So your grasses or your crop is going to um, dry out faster. So you want to keep those strong roots and keep your grass at three inches or higher. That's the absolute ideal. Um, and having your pastures rest during the winter. So that was pretty brief, uh, but I really wanted to give time for uh, Don and Rod Perry to talk about the practices that they have on their farms. Uh, Don is a beef, he's going to go first. He's a beef farmer in Blaine, Washington, or, and he uh, has been on his family's farm uh, since, actually, I missed, Rod is going to go first, sorry. <laughs> so Rod's going to go first, he's not a Blaine farmer. Uh, Rod's a dairy farmer, he grew up on a dairy and now operates one. Um, he's a WSU grad, and he's on the Sumas Watershed Improvement District. We had the Bertrands um, sponsoring this one, but he's on the Sumas one. Um, and his dairy is very innovative, and he has a PSC certificate for um, being uh, energy efficient. So, Rod, you're up. <laughs> and you can advance with the, the arrow. Yep. Okay, I'm Rod Perry. I'm a dairy producer. Chuck called me and wanted to me to share all my problems. <laughs> so, 
I, I kind of want to talk about two things, water and electricity. And the first thing on uh, the water was the gutters and the uh, downspouts. And uh, uh, this uh, fall I went through the gutters and I noticed some of the uh, nails and the uh, spacers were out. So I put in the ones that they have the bracket and the screws. And uh, while I was up there putting a few on, I noticed some of the nails on the roof had rusted out. On a dairy barn, you got the uh, ammonia, so you got to be careful. You got to check those nails too, because the big storm's coming. They always say. And uh, so I replaced a few of the nails, uh, not all of them. And on a roof, uh, you use the, I use the inch and a half screws, and then where the ridge overlaps, two inches. So that's kind of important on, on, on that. And uh, is there anything else I want to talk about on the gutters? Uh, that's pretty much it. As long as they're in good shape, they, they work fine. Oh, this is the flow, the continuous flow, yeah. the continuous water. Well, on the dairy farm, we really don't have rainwater going into any of them, but it's, it's, it's water. So yeah, to prevent it, a problem from freezing, you got to have uh, continuous water going in. And uh, I don't know if anybody is familiar with the Hudson float, but you can put a little uh, frost-free thing on there and it always weeps. The problem with that is you have to have a bigger tank to, to store it. So, uh, and uh, enough animals to drink it so it doesn't overflow. Because overflow is a big problem. Now, I'm assuming this is a Northeaster. You don't want it overflowing in a Northeaster because it gets ice built. But uh, they've gone to, uh, from these Hudson floats to these Miracle floats. And these Miracle floats do not have an overflow on them. So I made one. Uh, basically, does that, does that have a printer? You can just use your finger too. Okay, the, the uh, right here you can see there, I, I installed a, a little valve, one of those simple little valves, and put a little hose. Now this hose is too long. Usually I want it, you can see it on this one. This is actually working. Uh, you just uh, open this up during the winter and it, uh, the water comes out and keeps this float warm so it doesn't freeze. And they, they, they install these on these tip tanks so you got to be very careful. You got to have the float down lower so you don't overflow it and have a big ice build up and have a calgo response. Okay, that's what I was uh, talking about there. Oh, this is on a frost, uh, one of these, uh, what do they call that? Frost, it's a frost free thing I have sitting outside. Well, when it gets down below 15 degrees, guess what? Freezes. And part of the problem, I don't have enough animals on it. So I installed a, I drilled a hole and installed one of these heaters. And it sits on the bottom. And uh, I installed that through there, and then you got to add the, uh, the cord. And uh, you plug it in in the wintertime. Uh, on these frost free ones, too, it's always best to go out when it's 15 degrees and go and pump it because they keep from freezing because of water moving. As long as you got water moving, it's not going to freeze. So that's what I've done here. Uh, yeah, this is a, uh, my roof water. I have a diversion on the roof water. Well, it's not uh, I put a little valve, I see it's broken, but it still works. Uh, it goes here to a, uh, a foot bath, or from the foot bath, it goes to the end of the tunnel. If I were to do it again in a tunnel, I'd have all my wastewater that goes from the milk house go into the end of the tunnel to keep it flushed out. But this is a poor man's way of doing it. Uh, it the valve is out, so it's draining to the crib. Uh, I've got a drain and it goes to the creek. The only thing I can say about drains uh, that I could add to the Karina's uh, discussion is check the ends to make sure they're unplugged. <laughs> we had two eight-inch tile at one place and they were plugged. They got a, uh, the worst thing you can have is these plastic uh, bags. They got in the intake on the suction end and plugged it up and we had a pond about four, four million gallons. So yeah. It's, it's a big deal to make sure the drains are plugged, unplugged. And this happened to be uh, an extension of one, so there was a, a suction end in that by the creek. Yeah. So yeah, make sure they're unplugged. Uh, yes. 
Oh, look at that. Oh my <laughs> gosh, look at all the headers and the vowels and stuff. What I'm trying to show is here, uh, years ago, supply uh, people, they put in a lot of waters and, and stuff in the milk house and never put any shut ups up. Always have a way to shut the water off. They just put them in, and then it, it came to Northeaster, you know, because we, I, I, occasionally we get one. And then it froze, well, you couldn't shut anything off. It was a mess. So make sure you, uh, when you put a system in, you always have shutoffs all over the place. Uh, what else do I want to show here? Oh, that's, that's it. Oh, yes, the lagoon is down. <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> Winter level, full level. Okay, that's good. Always having the free board. I think it's there. Yeah. Oh, expect, there, there, expect the unexpected. I always get that. Oh, oh, this is my my border, my crab border from the creek. Wonderful. Uh, a lot of places uh, on, on the creek, you, you can't really farm right to it. So you really don't, in some places, you don't lose a lot of time. Okay. All the curtains, uh, what am I trying to show here? Uh, two things that I can see is the overhang. When you have a curtain, make sure, make sure the overhang is at least two feet. This is an older barn and it's not, it's not, as, uh, it's not two foot over so the wind does blow in. These curtains have to roll uh, basically down. They go up to roll them up and then down. So yeah, it's uh, the kind of opposite of what you want. It'd be best if it was going to happen. That's the way they're designed, they're simple. But if you have a two foot overhang, there's no real, no real problem. And always try, I wonder if we got another picture of that too. That's, uh, oh, that's another picture of the cover crop. I planted this after, this is a cover crop, not a relay crop. So uh, we'll see if there's any difference in the tonnage. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, we'll I'll do one of each next year and find out. Well, you have to do half the field or every other, every 10 feet. Sure. <laughs> uh, it will be interesting this year if the ducks and the geese come in and eat it all. Because at the other field, they, they mowed it down. They had nothing in the spring. I mean, they mowed everything. Pulled out of the ground. It was a potato field, so they had a little bit of potatoes too. And another thing that happens uh, when they work a potato field, they work it real fine so the water can't get down, so it makes a pond. And then pretty soon the pond gets bigger and bigger, and the ducks, and it happened to be in the middle of a section, so there was no hunters. Uh, and there were no houses around there, hunters. But, uh, it, it, uh, there was just thousands of uh, ducks and geese and swans. What variety do you typically? Well, this was uh, just a cover crop, and this was just what it would be. So we'll, we'll find out. You got your last one. Oh, yeah. That's done. That's oh, you're that's done. done. So if there's anything I, else you I want done? to No, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about electricity. Please. No. OK. Electricity, there's a couple things uh, that you want to do. You, you have to have a second source of uh, power, usually a generator. The best thing to do with that is to keep it in a dry spot and if you're really into it, you would put a, a little heater under it to keep it dry so you won't have any problems. Another thing, when you hook up the generator, you want to secure the throttle. I don't know if anyone remembers the Farmall Age. Remember the Farmall Age? It had, the, uh, it had that little uh, notch where you, you set the throttle and it wouldn't move. Well, on these modern tractors, guess what can happen? You're out there, the tractor starts, you get the generator going, and the throttle comes back because it's not tight enough. And then what happens? Everything blows up on the farm because uh, it's using too, uh, it, it wants to use more power. The voltage goes down and so the ramps go up. So you want to secure that throttle. I use a little bungee to do that with. The other thing you can do too on pretty much everyone has computers. You want a battery backup. You want to uh, interrupt a power supply on that uh, on the AP, uh, ABC power supply they have a power chute you can tell you can go in there and tell what the voltage is so if you look at that you know if your generator is working correctly 
because it'll tell you if it's 100, usually it's around 120, 123, 125 volts. If that starts going down, then your generator's not working. Uh, what else do we need to talk about electricity? Uh, actually, it, uh, the last storm, which is a lot of hype from the, uh, the news media, uh, they knew two days ahead that it wasn't going to be that bad. So you got to be a little careful with the hype on some of these storms, but you want to be prepared too. Um, any questions? Well, thank you, Rod. Okay. So next we're going to have Don Hooper, who's a cattleman in Blaine. He grew up on his family farm. They had chicken, a big chicken farm, and then he bought it from his parents, and now. And then, um, and he now uh, raises Hereford cattle on that. So if you'd like to come up, Don, okay, talk so about your. We can do um, a lot of questions for everybody at the end too, yeah. just so you know we'll have everyone, all speakers come back up.
try to keep, uh, like they say, you're supposed to leave the grass so long, you know. The cattle don't read that book. <laughs> <laughs> They'll overgraze patches and won't graze some. But I found that if you clip the pastures about four inches tall, the next rotation, that's a new, new sprout of grass, and they may eat that the next time around. So that does work. And it also keeps the buttercup down some. And that's, uh, that's just a problem you've got to deal with about every, every 10 years. you just got to go out and get angry about it. I think MCPA is the answer. It has a short grazing restriction too. Oh, what else? What else do you need to do? You've got lots of slides. I don't know what's on here. That was your pasture one. Oh, let's see what pasture's on. This is one I just plowed up this, this fall. I did the, that was planted the, the 18th of September. And it's just now starting to sprout. And this time, this field I planted uh, tall fescue. I don't know what the results are going to be. But when this is over, I'll probably learn everything my dad tried to teach. <laughs> well, that's how that works. But this is this was a two-acre piece, and, uh, and I uh, the one thing I didn't change uh, it used to have a couple of ditches in it. I can't find them now. You know, I think they think ditches are all navigable waters uh, these days, and I don't have any anymore. <laughs> Made swales on them. It seems I can drive across it. Crushed concrete is the best. I read some of that too. Well, 
Exactly. If you can get crushed concrete that's uh, you know, a five eighths, three quarter, somewhere in there. Of course, you get a little metal with that too. <laughs> but it it it's stable. It it packs down and it's it's stable. Yeah, we got another photo of your confinement area. Yeah. Yeah. Whoops. I think like, it's in a few more. We won't. Okay. Anyway, you might as well talk about them. This is my <coughs> my compost bin. Of course, now it's full of tractors. <laughs> uh, you see on the on the top of that uh, block wall, I got tired of trying to tug these big old tarps around. Well, they get pretty heavy. You know, that's uh, what, 30 feet across and 45, 50 feet long. You get a tarp on there, that's pretty darn heavy when it's wet. So I built myself a three window shade. I just rolled Your next slide shows it. And that, that's what got to pull out some. Got a hand crank to wind it up. Boy, that's a lot easier to handle. And then let's see. Are there any questions about it? It's just, just made out of scrap. I guess I might, might tell you that I'm, I'm an auto mechanic. It's an auto mechanic by trade. I taught automotive sketch and now I call it for 21 years. I'm a welder, amateur welder, amateur machinist, old time drag racer. Machines are not a mystery to me. <coughs> any, any questions about that? These tarps, by the way, are about 20 years old, so the rats have got to them here in there to know this. And this, uh, Shows the cattle that mound there that's got wood chips on the bottom. That's a crushed rock mound there. And I've recently put, let's see, I put uh, 40, 42 yards of crushed rock in this year to level with the guard up and get to the puddles. And uh, it seems to be pretty stable. Is there cement under the mountains, or is it? Uh, there, this is there's a concrete strip down the side here, but the rest of it is uh, uh, most of it has brown cloth under it, down there somewhere. Didn't <laughs> down that far, but I refilled it. And uh, we're we're kind of looking that this is adaptive management. It used to be like 20 bucks a unit for hot fuel. And now the U.S. price is like 70 bucks a unit. You now it's like 700 dollars for a 10 unit load versus 200. Oh so yeah, it's pretty hard, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm already running a nonprofit organization. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is, in a way, this is an experiment. To see, you know. I think that's your last slide. There. Oh, that the so there's, one? yeah. So if there's anything else you wanted to talk about on your farm. Uh, oh, no, there's questions. I've, I've struggled with this for, when did I start? 96 something. Was that when I got my first farm plant? I think so. I got into this deal with the oyster growers in Great Harbor. And that's so why I ran over the conservation district, got a farm plant, and when they come yelling at me, I have to stop the farm, and I held that up and said, Go talk to these folks, don't <laughs> That's been a standoff all these years. You know, Don, there's a good good thing you got there. It's a good illustration of, of the cattle naturally prefer to stand out on high ground as mm -hmm. opposed to stand oh, yeah. in the water. And you, you know, by that picture it shows that. It's a damn good thing those animals don't have thumbs. <laughs> Anybody who's dealt with them has knows that they've got to get up pretty early in the morning to stay ahead of the rest. One um, small thing I've discovered. You know, if I, if I, my water tank. That water tank, you see, right in here is a hole that's coming down to it. Well, I started out, I put green plastic holes. 
And the, the damn young animals, the yearlings and the calves, ate the green jacket off that hose every time I put it up there. I finally found a hose they don't like. It's all black rubber hose. They won't touch it. <laughs> it took me a couple of years to figure that out. <laughs> you know, they're, they're something to work with. My herd is a quiet herd. I've worked years at that. Probably used about AI breeding for about 35 years. <laughs> I've done seriously for since I retired in 20, 22 years. That herd has been <coughs> raised our own replacement animals. It's been the AI herd for 35 years. Boy, they have some nice animals. Originally, they were around 1,200 pounds in two years. Now they're 1,500, 1,600 pounds. They're all the step up. <laughs> and they're quiet. Fence breakers, nervous cattle, in the truck. Why not why? Mm -hmm. Any other any questions? You get rocks out of your, out of your field when you spread the herd? Uh, the crushed rock doesn't bother me. I had <laughs> pit run. And of course, pit run, you can hear every time it goes through your threader. <laughs> But I, I've called all the pit run out in the fields now, so I've gotten it crushed, and it doesn't bother. One thing I've had to change, uh, I use a scraper, a box scraper, to, to keep most of the material off of the off the feet. I scrape it down to the end and stack it in the feet. And I put wider shoes on the edges of the, of the, uh, the scraper so it doesn't dig into the gravel and it just coasts over the top. That seems to be working. Uh, I got lots of good I got something like 40 empty tractors, so if one's got a flat tire, I just go get another one. Huh. What do you do to keep your uh, water tank from freezing? Well, two things. One, I, I put a, a flow in it, you know, but, but it seems to me that. Uh, with a small amount of cows I got there now, I just shut the water off, take the hose off, take a quick disconnect, and I just shut it off in the cold weather. I feed them twice a day, so I just fill the tank. Then when the weather warms up, it just get back up. And then, uh, the float didn't work. Of course, if you're going to do the float, you got to got to put something on there to protect it. You know? Because this stands right out of the middle of the water. That's the other thing you've got to watch. Cows will break that float off every once in a while. But, uh, we have a lot of it in the middle of the tank so they can't touch it. I have all the, I guess I'm going back to talk about past rotation. This feedlot does work quite well. And one thing about it, I've, I've discovered that handling cattle, you can never have too many gates. Over the years, the perimeter and the, and the internal material in my feedlot, I think I got 18 gates. Now that might seem like a lot. But I tell you, you just about need that money to make it work. I use it to contain the animals when you put around through the pinch that's going to work on the animals. I just swing gates up and make a containment area and when, <clears throat> when we're done, we just pull the gates up against the fence and they're gone. Out of the way. And then, when you're running the cattle through, you need to be able to shut them into a holding pen. The ones you don't want to treat, you want to shut them off away from your pinch shoe. The more gates you got to And also locking the animals up. <clears throat> I guess I, you better get up early to beat them critters. I mean, it's so they get used to you coming in, uh, drive them in one way into the holding area for the pinch shoot. Say, oh no, I'm not going in there, I'm going to get shots. So I made mine so it's got gates on both hands. They won't go in this side 
I just drive around the other way and they think they're getting away. <laughs> <laughs> Questions for, for Don or for others? Don, do you have a drawing of that, your little tarp? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't, but it's, it's real simple. I can make you one in no time at all. What it is, that the tubing is an old grain auger, or a six-inch grain auger. I just weld the ends in it and put a sprocket on it. And, uh, it has it's two pieces, two, and this is the shaft that drives that one. They're side by side here, and there's a crank I slip on it, and wind them up. And 
and the bearings are are on my scrap and the big ball bearings usually run smooth glass. <laughs> Could be a side enterprise for you, making those for people. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's a double block right here. This is the yeah, sprung. That's about a know, five to one. Cranks are really easy. And it just sits on top of the block and all. <coughs> Don does his tires to, you know, as. Oh. And they're they're stacked right on the other side of the oh, back wall. We, we didn't put the picture on there. We had a couple oh. photos of that. Yeah, the tires. That, that's another trick. You know, you, you see every place you see tires on top of these tarps, and they're doing all. Everybody does it different. But I found that on mine, I go to pick up one of those tires, and it always poured water in my boot. <laughs> <laughs> To solve that problem, I took a four-inch hole saw and I punched the sidewall of the tires before I put them in the service up there. And that way, if you're careful about how you place them, you won't get any water. No place for the mosquitoes. You don't fill your boots with water. Boots always have a leak, you know, because of the top. <laughs> 